Regardless of your budget, there should be a camera in here for you. And all the cameras in this video I have owned or have extensive experience with, nothing in this video is theoretical or just based on specs. None of the cameras were given to me and none of these companies have ever paid me or flown me to an exotic destination. And I'm not gonna talk about the lenses in this video, but I am going to put a list of recommended kits in the description. So if you like one of the specific cameras, you'll be able to go down and look at the description and I'll have that camera with the lenses I recommend. I'll also put some links to the best prices that I found on all of these cameras and a number of them were on sale at the time of making this video. The first category is cameras under $300. And I think this is a fantastic little choice if you're on a strictly tight budget budget. This is a great photo camera. And in fact, I recently did a video on this camera, which I only paid a little over a hundred bucks for, but on average, you probably pay 250 to 290 for it, depending on what country that you're in. And I took this uh, camera and I compared the photos out of it to my Sony a6700, a camera that costs more than $1,200 or something like that. And when you look at the photos raw, right out of camera, you could not even tell the difference. In addition to that, this camera has many of the high-end features that the current Sony cameras have, including quite reliable autofocus and face recognition built into the camera. So this camera actually allows you to take pictures of your friends and family before you go on a trip, register it with the camera. And if you're out in a crowd full of people and you wanna take a photo and you wanna make sure that your friends or family are the ones that it's picking out of that crowd and keeps them in focus and focuses on their face, if you've registered them in the camera, it will pick them out of a crowd. This is something that a lot of new cameras of other brands still can't do. The other thing about the camera is it's very small, and I think it probably is the smallest E-mount camera ever made. Now, I will say that I think this camera, for me, is really a photo camera only. It does do video, but I think any modern smartphone is probably going to have better video or better quality video than what you're going to get out of this camera. But from the photo side of things, once again, you're gonna get photos that look like they're out of one of the new model Sony cameras. And there are two other Sony cameras that are gonna be kind of around a similar price point, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. And one is the Sony NEX7, so I would keep an eye out for that one under $300. And at a little over $300, you might find a Sony A5100. And if you find a Sony A5100 anywhere $300, I think that is a great price. And it is an excellent first camera. Now, the next one I wanna talk about is one that a lot of people don't know about. And that is the Olympus OM-EM1. And if we look at all the cameras that I've got in this video, this is probably one of the best cameras from a build and handling and just the way it feels in your hand and a functionality point of view. This is a true pro level camera at a fraction of the price of some of the other cameras in here. And in fact, I would say I've got cameras in this uh, list that are $2,500. And when you're using it, this feels like a nicer camera and it can be bought consistently for under $300. First of all, talking about the photo quality. The photos are absolutely excellent and Olympus is known to have excellent skin tones and natural colors. And I think the color coming out of this camera is definitely better than the Sony and probably on par with Canon's color science as far as skin tones go. The other thing this camera has is in-body image stabilization. Now this is insane that you can get in-body image stabilization for under $300, but this has it and the quality and the performance of the IBIS is as good as most of the modern cameras now, and it's better than most of the current model Sony cameras. The other thing is the autofocus. While it isn't as fast as a lot of the modern cameras, it is extremely accurate. So when it tells you that something's in focus and it's locked onto it, it is. And although it's not as fast as the modern cameras, it is still reasonably fast. The other thing about this camera is just the pure build quality. This is a primarily metal body and the ergonomics are phenomenal. There's so many different programmable buttons and dials. It really gives you a pro level control. It's also a weather sealed camera. So the feature set that you're getting out of this camera at under $300 is really unmatched. And the only reason that's the case is because two parts. One, this is a micro four third sensor camera. That means that the sensor is smaller than APS-C and it's about, it's a double crop or two times crop versus full frame. 
The other thing about it is, is a micro four thirds mount and micro four thirds as a mount is kind of on the way out where we see Sony is still going stronger than ever. So when we look at this under $300 price point category, my suggestion would be is in the future, if you're thinking about going with Sony and that's the direction that you envisioned yourself, you can buy the Sony camera, you're using an E-mount camera, and any lenses that you buy for this camera, even cheap manual ones, you can use up on a Sony camera that costs five or $6,000. But if you're really just focused on getting a small camera now, getting the best quality camera that you can get under $300, and you're not worried about eventually shooting uh, Sony full frame or something like this, what you're getting in this camera at under $300 is incredible. And if this was an APS-C Sony E-mount camera, this honestly would be an $800 camera. So as far as what you're getting for your money, you absolutely are not going to be able to beat the E-M1. And once again, you can also get, the other nice thing about the Micro Four Thirds mount is you can get some quite affordable, high quality lenses for it. And I'll put that list with the OM E-M1. I'll put a link to our list of some of those lenses in the description down below. Now we're gonna jump up in price to the under $600 category. And the first camera I'm gonna recommend here is the Canon M50. This camera was so popular. I mean, it virtually has a cult following. It has Canon's APS-C sensor. It's a 24 megapixel sensor. And actually the current model of Canon crop sensor cameras, including the Canon R50 and the R10, have an evolved version of that sensor, but not a lot has changed. And because of that, if you take a photo with the Canon M50 and you take a photo with Canon R10 with the new sensor, in most situations, you cannot even tell the difference between between the two photos. The one place that you will see a difference is in low light situations or when you're running a high ISO on the Canon M50, it will have more noise in the image, but that's generally not because the sensor is better, that's because the Canon R10 and Canon R50 are actually processing that image and taking some of that noise and cleaning that image up. You can take the Canon M50 and put it in any modern photo editing software, use the noise reduction and get as good, if not better result by doing that in editing. So as far as the image quality you're gonna get, it's identical to the modern cameras. You're also going to get Canon's color science, including skin tones. The other thing you're gonna get is the Canon ergonomics. This a camera kind of feels like any of the big modern Canon cameras, but in a small little package. And you're also going to get a Canon EFM lens mount, which is a mount that they no longer make anymore, but you can still find plenty of the lenses, both new and used. And one of the great things about the EFM lenses is they're both small and generally inexpensive. But in addition to that, you're not limited to using Canon EFM lenses because you can use an adapter and you can use any of Canon's old catalog of EF lenses. So you have a huge range of affordable lenses and in the EF mount lenses, you have some very small lenses. Now, the only thing I will say about this camera, it is a 1080p video camera effectively only. It does 4K with a crop and you lose the good quality autofocus that Canon is known for. So I consider this a 1080, sort of a lower resolution, just normal HD video camera. And because of that, if you're gonna do a lot of video shooting, it's not a camera that I'm currently recommending, but if you're primarily a photo shooter, you're gonna get those ergonomics, color science, and a huge lens library that you can access when using this camera. And for that reason, I do highly recommend it. Now, in some ways, the next camera is almost the opposite of the last camera. This is an incredible video camera and just an okay photo camera in my mind. And as far as video cameras go, this is the best video camera under $600. And to be honest, it might be the best video camera under $1,000. This is the Panasonic GH5, and this camera was so good when it came out. There were people that were actually switching from full-frame cameras to this micro four-thirds camera just because it was so good at video. And it was, and to this day, is still one of the most popular video cameras for YouTube. So many people built their YouTube careers, whether they were making photos and videos like, like I do for this channel, talking about photo and video equipment, or just being vloggers, the GH5 was a hugely popular camera. 
And one of the biggest headline features of this camera is the incredibly high quality in-body image stabilization, which in a lot of situations completely eliminates the need for a gimbal. And the in-body image stabilization in this camera is better than most of the current model Sony cameras and most of the current model of just about anything other than the other Panasonic cameras because they really do the best IBIS system in both full frame and micro four thirds. This camera also can shoot in 10 bit log footage, which is incredible for a camera at this price point. It also can shoot open gate video, which means it uses the entire sensor to shoot video rather than most cameras which crop in and only give you 16 by nine. It's an extremely customized camera. It's got so many different buttons and dials that you can customize. It has a huge amount of exposure tools for using in video. It's a weather sealed body. Probably the biggest detracting feature on this lens is the fact that the autofocus tends to be unreliable and you really need to babysit it. So if you're a person that really needs bulletproof autofocus and you want to be able to just point the camera at something and not even think about it, then this probably isn't the camera for you. But if you're able to put up with that unreliable autofocus and babysit a little bit, or if you want to use like high quality manual focus cinema lenses, this is honestly a camera that you could give to a student just out of film school. He could go shoot a feature film. He or she could shoot a feature film and probably win awards at any of the major film festivals. That's how good this camera is as a video camera. Now, the next one I'm going to bring up is a Fujifilm camera. Once again, we're still under $600. This is a Fujifilm X-T1. But if you're lucky, you might even find a Fujifilm X-T2 in this price category. And I think the main reason that I would suggest looking at this camera is if you're somebody who's interested in those Fuji ergonomics, those manual buttons and dials, and that's something that you're really interested in, then I would, I would strongly consider either an X-T1 or an X-T2. And there will people out, be people out there that haven't used the Fuji cameras and are go, oh, you know, it's silly, you're going for a camera for looks. But honestly, I think not only the looks, but the way that this camera works and the way it kind of slows you down and it's so tactile, gives you a completely different shooting experience. And it's absolutely not a gimmick I love shooting with these Fuji cameras with the full buttons and dials. And I think this Fujifilm X-T1, 2, 3, 4 series is the best of it because you've got your ISO dial, you have your shutter speed dial, and then you have your aperture ring on here, and then you've got your exposure compensation dial. So you have the full range of controls. You don't have to go into the menu system. Once you get down to the X-T30, X-T30 Mark II, something like that, you lose some of those and you kind of lose some of that tactile functionality. So I do feel like if you are going to go Fuji, I do prefer this X-T1, 2, 3 series. Now in the X-T1, you're only going to get a 16 megapixel sensor. If you get an X-T2, you're gonna get a 24 megapixel sensor. X-T2 is gonna give you two card slots and better video features, improved ergonomics, improved autofocus. So in general, the X-T2 is a better camera if you can find it at a good price point. But a lot of people actually prefer the X-T1 because it, they think it gives them more organic images. And we're in this thing where we're looking for this sort of perfect, imperfect image quality and people are going with older cameras. The X-T1 has become very, very popular for that. And for that reason, there isn't always a huge difference in price between the X-T1 and the X-T2. Moving up to a budget of under $1,000, the first camera I'm gonna talk about is the Canon R50. Now this is an improved version of the Canon M50 with the new Canon RF lens mount. And from an image quality perspective, there's really not going to be any difference. Where you will see the difference is the autofocus performance, the speed, and the fact that you now have access to Canon RF lenses. And prior to a couple of months ago, this is not actually a camera that I would have recommended. A big change has come about in that Sigma is now offering a range of lenses on the Canon RF mount, which I think make this a much better camera because they are better quality lenses than what Canon was previously offering, and they are at fair prices. So previously wouldn't have recommended this camera, now I am. The other thing you're gonna get is you're gonna get Canon's legendary color science and skin tones, similar to you get with all the other Canon cameras. You're gonna get Canon's ergonomics, where you've got this sort of camera that feels like a big pro-level camera, but in a tiny little body. 
you're gonna get Canon's bulletproof du dual pixel autofocus. So if you're chasing kids around or you're doing events or anything like that, it's a camera that rarely misses. And the other thing about this, particularly when we look at this camera as a step up from the Canon M50, is the video quality. You are going to get incredibly high quality 4K video out of this camera. So although the photo quality isn't gonna be that different than the Canon M50, you're gonna get incredibly high quality 4K video and you are going to get some bulletproof, very fast autofocus. So I do think it can be worth the upgrade if you do have the money to go to the Canon R50. Because of that RF lens mount, it is a bit more of a future-proof camera. Now, the next one I'm gonna talk about is, effectively, this is Sony's alternative to the Canon R50. And I'm gonna talk about two cameras here. Uh, one is the Sony A6100, and the other one is the Sony ZV-E10. And these are actually quite similar cameras. To start with, the A6100, the biggest difference is the A6100 is going to have a viewfinder on the camera, where this one does not have a viewfinder on it. And, but they have the same sensor, 24.2 megapixel. They both shoot at 11 frames per second. They both have extremely advanced autofocus, and they both shoot high-quality 4K video. The Sony ZV-E10 is what they're considering more of a vlogger camera, and it has a number of video features that are better than the A6100. But the A6100 is a better hybrid camera because it has the EVF that you can look through and use for standard photography. So in my comparing these two cameras, I would say if you're interested in getting into the Sony lineup, these are great starting points. They have most of the features that even the latest new release cameras have. If you're more of a photo shooter, I would go with the 6100. If you're more of a video shooter, I would go with the ZV-E10. The next camera I'm gonna talk about, I don't currently own, but I have actually owned it twice in the past and I kind of miss it. It's very similar to the Fujifilm X-T1, so I'll just bring that out as an example. And that is the Fujifilm X-T3. Now, the X-T3 is a true pro camera because you're gonna get a lot of the features that are required in pro cameras. To start with, it's going to be a weather sealed body. It's got those classic ergonomics that the, these Fuji X-T series have. And it's probably my favorite photo camera at this price point. When we look at the sensor, it has the same sensor as the current model's uh, Fujifilm X-S20. So even though it is an older sensor, it's still a sensor that is being used in cameras today and the image quality absolutely holds up. The other thing is it has most of the current film simulations. They've added a couple of new film sims since then, but it has most of them. And as a sort of pro level camera, it has dual card slots. So you can put in two card slots and you can shoot photos and it can shoot JPEG to one and RAW to the other or shoot both to one, back up to the other. So this is a feature that you would need if you're shooting photos and you absolutely can't afford to have a card failure. You're going to get dual card slots. The other thing is the video side of things is true pro level video as well. This is 10 bit log footage video. I've seen people at sort of Formula One races and out doing commercials, shooting on an X-T3 on a gimbal. The camera doesn't have IBIS, so that is something to keep in mind if you're not using an image stabilized lens. But yeah, there are people doing commercial video with that camera, and it's a phenomenal camera. And the price I'm talking about, this price, we're talking about a used price because they don't make that camera anymore. You can also look at the Fujifilm X-T30 Mark II as an alternative, but I would take the Fujifilm X-T3 as a used camera over that camera if I could find it and you were comfortably comfortable buying used. Now we're getting into the under $1,500 category. And before I get into the main cameras I wanna talk about in this category, I do have a couple of honorable mentions that I want to go over. And that is the Sony A6700 and the Canon R7. Now these are both of these companies high-end APS-C cameras, and because of that, the price point of these cameras is very similar or starts to overlap with the entry-level full-frame cameras. And I wanna talk about, just briefly, who might buy these rather than going with an entry-level full-frame camera. To me, the advantage these cameras have over the, oh, those entry-level full-frame cameras is one, you're gonna be able to use APS-C lenses. That means your lenses are going to be smaller and they're generally going to be cheaper. 
Two, if you're already shooting in this camera system, one of these two camera systems, and you've got APS-C, this is gonna allow you to go up to what are effectively pro-level APS-C bodies and use your current set of lenses. And three, in some situations, you do want a smaller sensor for that faster readout for video or to be more cropped in so you're more zoomed in, like in wildlife photography. So there definitely are situations where people will pick a crop sensor camera over a full frame camera camera intentionally, and I think these are fantastic cameras, but I think for a lot of people starting out now, once they get to around this $1,500 price point, they're more likely to be looking at entry-level full-frame cameras, so I'm going to focus most of this segment on those entry-level full-frame cameras. And the first one I want to talk about is the Canon R8, and this camera is an incredible bargain for what it is. And yeah, I almost feel like with this camera is so cheap, it's as if Canon is doing what they have done with their with their printers, where they sell you the printer cheap with this tiny little ink cartridge, and then you go out and then you have to keep replacing the ink cartridges, and that's where they make all their money. This body, as a high-quality, entry-level, full-frame body, is insanely good, and it has the same sensor as the Canon R6 Mark II, which is a camera that costs anywhere between $1,000 and $1,500 more, almost twice the price as the Canon R8. And I feel like they've kind of sold this camera at this price point as a gateway drug into their full-frame system, hoping that you will eventually buy some of their full-frame lenses, which with Canon tend to be very expensive. But setting that aside, this is an extra excellent camera body. It is weather sealed. It comes with Canon's, of course, legendary ergonomics, and it's super easy to use menu system. It can shoot 10-bit 4K video, 40 frames per second electronic shutter, and the combination I've got here is the R8 with the 24 to 105 f4 lens with image stabilization. And this combination I find can basically do everything. It is incredible that you can get this camera body effect. It's actually currently on sale. It gets $200 off. It's closer to $1,300 than $1,500 particularly if you're a Canon person. You know, I know a lot of people have just always dreamed of having a Canon full-frame camera. I think this is a great opportunity to do that. Now, a camera I don't have in front of me, but I have significant experience with is the Sony a7C. And that current retail price on that is like $1,598, but there's currently a rebate on it. I will put a link in the description down below to those details. This is an incredible camera because the body is so compact. It's similar to Sony's APS-C size sensor cameras, but you're getting a full-frame camera. And it might very well be the smallest full-frame camera on the market right now. I'm not sure. It would certainly have to be close you're still getting a 24.2 megapixel sensor. And essentially you're getting what was uh, Sony's old A7 III with a number of upgrades to the autofocus system and to the electronics and the processing in the camera, but you're getting it in a super small package. You're also getting in-body image stabilization, which doesn't happen to be great for video, but it's better than not having it at all. And it is excellent for photography. Now, this camera does shoot 4K video, but it is only 8-bit. And so I think when I compare the video footage out of this camera, the a7C, to the Canon R8, I think the Canon R8 is a better video camera than the Sony a7C. But you are getting into the Sony full-frame lineup, and there are a ton of very affordable lenses for the Sony a7C and the E-mount lineup. So... I think you do have to weigh that advantage. And I think in a lot of situations when you're debating between two cameras and one of them's a Sony, you can almost go for the Sony purely for the availability of lenses and the availability of more affordable lenses. Now I'm gonna jump back to a APS-C sensor camera, which probably you thought we were done with, but this camera in just represents incredible value for what it is. This is the Fujifilm XS20. I think this is a camera that I would recommend for somebody who is a video shooter first because the video quality out of this camera is phenomenal and it's so good that I probably would pick it over a number of full frame cameras in a lot of situations. Now, first of all, it's got a 26.1 megapixel sensor, but the important part is it shoots 10-bit 422 video. It also shoots open gate video 6.2K resolution. So this is gonna give you higher resolution, more sensor usage than you can get at any full frame camera at this price point. It also has most of Fuji's current film simulations. 
it also has excellent in-body image stabilization. So I think particularly if you want to keep your kit small and you are video shooter first, this might be a situation where you would take an APS-C sensor camera over a full frame camera. I wouldn't do this for the photography side, but I would do it for the video side. And you're getting high resolution video and you're getting open gate video, both which are huge things to get in a camera at this price point. Now we're up to cameras under $2,500 and I'm just gonna throw this one in as an honorable mention. This is the Nikon ZF. I had to mention this camera because if you're somebody that's into those Fuji style buttons and dials and you like those classic ergonomics, which I am somebody that does, and photography for you is a lot about just getting out there and having fun in that tactile experience. And if you've ever wondered, can the Nikon ZF be like a full frame version of what Fuji has? And my answer to that is yes. And if you're somebody who gets inspired by using a camera in this format, or even looking at a camera that looks like a classic film camera, I will say this is not just the placebo effect or anything like that. Feeling inspired and wanting to go out and engaging with that ergonomic experience is a big part of photography. And if you're a person that was ever wondering, could this be the camera for me? Then my answer to you, yes, it probably is. So if you are that person, I can highly recommend this camera. But the main camera is just based on the performance that they give you in this category. The first one I'm gonna recommend is the Lumix S52 or S52X. And when this camera is on sale body only, it's around $1,700. So it's almost fitting into that $1,500 category. And I think for what you get, it is the best camera bang for your buck for under $2,500. And it probably is right now my favorite camera. I just love using this camera. I love the performance. I love the image quality. I love the feel in the hands. Ergonomically, I can remember the first time I got this camera, I handed it to my daughter who loves to play with the new cameras I get in. And she, after shooting with it for, you know, better part of, a, part of a half day, she says to me, yeah, dad, I can tell this is definitely the most expensive camera you've ever bought. And I said, it's not the most expensive camera I've even ever bought. It's not even actually all that close. And she was shocked, but honestly, that is the way this camera feels. It is so well built. It is so nice to use. It is so intuitive ergonomically that I don't think anybody will be disappointed if you buy this camera. In addition to that, as a full frame camera, the IBIS in this is insane. It really does eliminate the need to use a gimbal in a wide range of situations. It has a number of electronic cropping in modes where you truly could not tell the difference between what you're getting out of this and a gimbal. The IBIS is not only great for video, it allows you to do is extremely long exposure photos, like up to a second plus. You just can't believe how capable the IBIS in this system is. And really, it kind of makes everybody else look silly because it's that good. The other thing about it is the image quality of photo and video is excellent, and I love the colors out of it. Now, when it comes to color, these things are very much personal preference, and there are some people that like Canon, Sony, Nikon, whatever, but there are a lot of people out there that think Panasonic does have the best colors, and I don't know if it's just because I've used those cameras a lot more before, and now I'm using Panasonic for the first time over the past sort of 18 months, but I do really love the image quality coming out of these cameras, particularly in video. I think the video quality is fantastic. The other thing this camera has is a set of advanced video features that make it almost like a hybrid camera, but also a cinema camera all in one. It shoots open gate video as well and shoots 6K video. So you can shoot full sensor video at 6K, but you can also shoot 16 by nine at 6K. And I've done this a number of times for YouTube videos, particularly when I'm out running and gunning, because that 6K allows me so much room to reframe and crop. And you can't even tell that I've cropped in, which is an absolutely huge advantage. And I genuinely believe if this set of features was in a Sony or Canon camera, it would be a thousand dollars more than what you're paying for this camera. It is just so much camera for the money. Now there are a couple of, couple of disadvantages I should mention looking at the Panasonic cameras. The first thing is the li lens library is much more restrictive than what you can get on Sony. And although Sigma does make lenses for the L mount, Tamron does not. 
and there is a much smaller lens selection. I think there's plenty for everything that you might need, but you're not going to have nearly as big a lens selection. The other thing is the autofocus in this camera isn't on par with the new Sony's. Since the recent firmware updates, it's so close that I don't think there is a meaningful difference between the two, but the Sony autofocus currently is like mind reading. It just, you just point the camera and it just never ever misses where you might find that the Panasonic might miss, I don't know, two or 3% of the time now, but it will at times miss or be uncertain in situations where the Sony's won't. Speaking of Sony's, the next camera is the camera that I probably use more than any camera that I own. And you know, so this is, basically a legendary standard cam right now. This is the Sony a7 IV, and it's probably the most reliable camera that you can buy on the market right now. It has a 33 megapixel sensor, so now we're stepping up to a point where we're getting higher resolution in a full frame sensor. We've got pretty good IBIS, certainly it's nowhere near what the Panasonic is, but it's pretty good, and if you use the electronic stabilization, you get a small crop and it gets even better. You've got 10-bit 4K video, which is incredibly detailed and looks excellent. And you really do notice that 33 megapixel sensor being downsized into that 4K video because you do get a huge amount of detail. And I know some people, some YouTubers even, that shoot the a7 IV over the a7S III, which is supposed to be the dedicated video camera because you get more detail out of the video footage out of the a7IV. And if you don't need the super low light of the a7S III, or you're not swinging the camera around where rolling shutter might be an issue, if you're just locked off on a tripod, this is actually a better video camera in those situations. The other thing, of course, you're gonna get the E-mount lens selection, which is absolutely massive. So although I think when you buy the Sony a7 IV, you don't find yourself just falling in love with this is the most fun camera to use of all time. And I must admit when I first got it, it felt a little bit lightweight and almost cheap. It is an absolutely bulletproof camera that does everything I need. And if my life depended on it, this is probably the camera I'm going to buy and use. Now, the next one I think is going to shock a lot of people because now we're back to an APS-C sensor camera again. And this is just Fuji doing this funny Fuji thing where they don't have a full frame camera, so they're actually making pro level APS-C sensor cameras. And this is the Fujifilm X-H2, and this camera is absolutely nuts. You get a 40 megapixel sensor, you also get 8K video, and out of any of the cameras that I've tested here, as far as the video footage goes, the 8K video out of this camera is so incredibly detailed. The only thing that I think is somewhat close to it, XS20 by Fuji is a little bit behind it. And I think the Sony a7 IV, because of that downsampling from the 33 megapixel sensor, is just a little bit behind it. But when you look at them all side by side, the amount of detail in the 8K video is just incredible like it really is incredible so i think as an 8k video camera at this price point i mean it's the cheapest 8k video camera that you can buy right now but in addition to that it is packed with a feature set that you just can't get in any other camera at this price point and a big one is a 5.67 million dot evf and when I looked in through this EVF for the first time, it was like, wow, I didn't even know that this was a thing or this was possible. The clarity was incredible. And particularly if you like to shoot with cinema lenses or manual focus lenses, it really allows you to nail focus without even punching in. And you get a level of detail and it's sort of an immersive photography or video experience using the EVF that you really don't get anywhere near that in any of the other cameras. You're also gonna get seven stop IBIS, which is excellent. And you're gonna get one CF Express type B port, which is this huge high speed CF Express port, which is a more reliable card. And it's also a much faster card, which helps with capturing that 8K video. In addition to that, if you're somebody's into the film simulations, you're going to get a range of film simulations in this camera. So when you compare this to the full frame offerings that I'm talking about, what you're really getting is you're sacrificing a sensor size. You're going down to an APS-C sensor. 
But in basically every other way, you are getting more high level features, even as far as the build quality goes. I think this is probably the best built camera in the lineup. And I would probably say the next one behind that would be a tie between the Panasonic camera and actually the $300 Olympus OMEM1 camera. So you are getting a true pro level feeling camera, but you're sacrificing the size of the sensor. And finally, the last camera in this lineup, which is my, uh, if money is no object, this is probably what I would own. This isn't a camera I own. It's actually currently on loan to me from Fujifilm. And that is the Fujifilm GFX 102. This is a 100 megapixel medium format sensor. And if you just look at the size of that sensor, it's absolutely huge. In fact, I'll just show you what that looks like compared to a full frame sensor. And if you just look, I mean, that is actually quite a big difference. I mean, we think a full frame as being big, but look at the size of that. Like that is, that is a massive, massive sensor. And it does a couple of things for you. The first thing was, and everybody talks about when you buy one of these medium format cameras, you've got the ability to crop in. And I just kind of thought, I don't know, does that really matter? Like how much do you actually, actually crop in? But it's kind of incredible once you start using it, you can take a photo and you take a big wide angle photo and you can crop like this tiny little part of the center out of it and you've got a person in it. And now you've got like a portrait photo out of that same image. So if you're a pixel peeper or you are just you know running and gunning and spraying photos, you can shoot wide and crop in and you can get a whole bunch of photos out of one photo. It's kind of fascinating. And I could see this actually quite useful for com commercial work, magazines, stuff like that. The other thing, and one of my favorite features of it, is it's got a 5.6K Vista Vision video format, which gives you full width video. It's cropped in, I think it's a 235 crop or aspect ratio. But this is an incredibly high quality medium format video in what is generally a hybrid camera. And although if we say, hey, price is no object, there's more expensive cameras that you can buy, I think the practicality of this camera with the fact that it's a 100 megapixel photo camera, but it's also a 5.6K VistaVision video camera makes it to me the best you know, cost is no object sort of camera. Well, that's a lot of cameras and a long video, but if you're still here and you wanna improve the qualities of your photos and videos, just using your phone or the camera you already have, just check out this video. I think it's the best tutorial I have ever done on photography. And I consistently get people telling me that there are concepts in that video that they've never heard of. And it's one of the best tutorials they've ever watched on YouTube. So I'd be very surprised if you watch that video to the end and you're not a better photographer at the end of that video than you are right now.